Hi there, Daily Gardeners. We are in the home stretch of the reviews for Good Campaign over at podchaser.com. And I just want to give a quick shout out to Marsha JS0083, who left a review for the show yesterday. And then just to give a big virtual hug to all of you who answered my call to be part of Podchaser's Reviews for Good Campaign 2022. You know, in my tenure experience of being a podcaster, no other podcast organization has been as generous as Podchaser, an organization that is willing to donate money for podcast reviews. It's just unheard of in the industry. Now, of course, you can always head on over to Podchaser and leave a review for the show, but it's during this month of April that Podchaser will donate 25 cents for your review and then 25 cents for my reply to World Central Kitchen. So if you have a chance, please consider leaving a review for the show over at podchaser.com. Just search for The Daily Gardener, and then when the podcast pops up, click on the little star rating, and then there's room for you to leave a review. And it doesn't have to be anything long. It's entirely up to you. The bottom line is it's very easy to do and so much good can come from it. Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is April 28th. Today in Garden History, we kick things off by celebrating Floralia. In the Roman calendar, April 28th marks the beginning of a six-day festival called Floralia, and it's held in honor of the goddess of flowering crops and plants, and she was known as Flora. Now, the goal of this week-long festival was an appeal to Flora for a great growing season, a bountiful harvest, safety for workers, and probably a good grape harvest for good wine. And today we celebrate the birthday of Harry Bolas, who was born on this day, April 28th in 1834. Harry was a South African botanist, artist, businessman, and philanthropist. And if you've ever heard of the Bolas Herbarium in South Africa... Well, it was named in honor of Harry. Harry founded the herbarium, and he bequeathed his large library and part of his fortune in order to establish the South African College, now known as the University of Cape Town. Harry Bolas was not originally from South Africa. He was actually born in Nottingham, England, and the school that he attended, Castle Gate School, had a headmaster who corresponded with a plant collector named William Kensett. And when Kensett was in need of an assistant, Harry Bolas was the student who was selected for the job. Harry moved to South Africa and promptly fell in love with William's sister, Sophia. The two were married, and they had three sons and a daughter. In 1864, when their oldest son died, a friend and fellow botanist named Francis Guthrie suggested that Harry take up botany to help heal his broken heart. Well, the rest, as they say, is history. Harry started his great botanical collection in 1865, and he soon struck up a correspondence with the most famous botanists of his day. And there's one other story about Harry Bolas that I thought you would enjoy. In 1876, he and Francis Guthrie traveled together to the world's mecca for botany, Kew Gardens in England, along with a large collection of plants for naming. And despite the fact that on their return voyage, their ship hit a reef and their collection was lost, Harry always referred to that trip as 40 happy days. Isn't that sweet? And it was on this day, April 28th in 1852, that the Swiss philosopher and poet Henri Frédéric Amiel wrote in his journal, Once more I feel the spring languor creeping over me, the spring air about me. 
This morning, the poetry of the scene, the song of the birds, the tranquil sunlight, the breeze blowing over the fresh green fields, all rose into and filled my heart. And today we celebrate the birthday of the New York City-based critic, publisher, and writer, Bonnie Marenka, who was born on this day, April 28th in 1947. In her 1988 book called American Garden Writing, Bonnie wrote, I judge a garden by the gardener who cares for it, the one who invests space with daydreams. How well I know the downward gaze into the face of the earth, the feeling of good dark soil that slips through the fingers in its rush to return to its dirty delirium. Each gardener creates an ideal world of miniature thoughts that drift languidly into each other like flowers on a dry afternoon. Here, silence has the rhythm of wishes. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Perfect Specimen by Derlin Anima. This book came out in 2019, and the subtitle is The 20th Century Renowned Botanist, Inez Mejia. Well, this book is a wonderful biography of Inez Mejia, the Mexican-American botanist who was born in 1870 and discovered the Sierra Club at age 50, and that led her to her life's calling and her legacy as a botanist. And so I love what Derlin wrote in the dedication of this book, because she wrote, this book is dedicated to those people who gained confidence in their abilities later in life. And that is certainly the case with Inez Mejia. She loved her experience with the Sierra Club so much that she decided to enroll in botany classes at Berkeley. In fact, over a 16-year period, she just kept taking botany classes on and off. She never had the goal of graduating. She just wanted to keep learning. So that's quite a paradigm shift. I mean, think about it. If the goal was not to graduate, but just keep learning, well, then all of us would just continue to take classes, continuing ed throughout our life. And as the mom of four young adults who are either in college or about to go to college, I love that perspective of being a lifelong learner. And that's certainly something that Inez achieved. Now, I don't want to give the impression that Inez was all about coursework and classrooms, because that's really only a very small portion of Inez's story. She was actually very drawn to field work and spending time in the field. She took countless trips through the southwestern part of the United States, into New Mexico, and even into South America. She was very drawn to unique plants. She loved sunflowers, and she was a voracious collector. In fact, many scholars argue that Inez was one of the most accomplished collectors of her time. On her very first collecting trip, she collected over 500 specimens, and that's essentially the same amount that Darwin collected on his first expedition on the Beagle. Over her lifetime, she collected over 150,000 specimens, 500 of which were brand new plant species that had never been identified before. She was just this extraordinary collector, and her story sadly came to an end in 1938 due to lung cancer. She was actually in Mexico on a plant collecting trip when she just could not go on any longer. And so she cut her trip short, returned to the United States, and then died at Berkeley that summer on June 12th. And aside from her staggering amount of work, she left a legacy when part of her estate was donated to the Redwood Preserve in California, which I think of as kind of a full circle moment, hearkening back to her work with the Sierra Club. And so 
40 acres of the Mejia estate was donated to this preserve, and one of the very tallest trees was named in honor of Inez Mejia, a woman who is definitely worthy of a biography. And I wanted to share just a little bit about what Derlin wrote in the author's note at the beginning of this book, because I think it does a wonderful job of outlining the extraordinary nature of Inez's story. So Derlin writes, most successful people, no matter their endeavor or occupation, find inspiration through either a parent, an important or inspirational person, or an event. This is not the case with Inez Mejia, a shy, quiet girl. She seemed to fade into the background with both her parents. She led a lonely life, which ironically aided her in her later endeavors. Mejia's is a story of retreat into self in the early years and then blossoming to reach her highest potential after 50 years old. It is also the story of a doctor who, during the infancy of psychiatry and psychology, mentored this woman to her potential and became the father figure she never had. Read, marvel, and enjoy Inez Mejia's story. It's a good one. This book is 174 pages of the life of the renowned botanist Inez Mejia. You can get a copy of The Perfect Specimen by Derlin Anima and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $14. Finally, we end the show today with a botanic spark that celebrates the birthday of Madeleine Francoise Bassaport, the French botanical artist, miniature painter, interior decorator, and teacher who was born on this day, April 28th in 1701. Madeline was the student of Claude Aubrier, the man who was honored with the naming of the Abricia genus. And the only reason that Madeline was able to study with Claude was that her talent was undeniable. And despite his own lack of credentials, Claude himself had risen through the ranks to become the royal painter of France. In 1741, Madeleine succeeded Claude as the official painter of the Royal Garden. Now, this was, as you can imagine, an unprecedented appointment since Madeleine was the very first woman to hold that position, and it was a role that she would carry for over four decades. Madeleine was 40 years old when she took on this assignment. She never married or had children. Instead, she focused on her job, where, at a minimum, she was required to produce 12 botanical paintings for the king every year. On top of that, King Louis XV gave Madeleine the responsibility of teaching all the princesses how to draw and paint flowers. And over the course of her career, Madeleine also taught botanical art to many other artists and scientific illustrators. She also, by the way, became the godmother to several children from academic families that she knew well. Now, one of her other jobs was working as an artist and designer for the king's official mistress, Madame Pompadour. Madame Pompadour was a major patron of creatives in architecture, porcelain, and decorative arts. And as it turned out, Madeleine had an instant rapport with Madame Pompadour. And after she captured the beauty of the flowers around Madame Pompadour's chateau, she insisted that the king give Madeleine a pay raise, and he did. Now, it's important to know that as the first female official painter of the Royal Garden, Madeleine did not work in a bubble. She exchanged letters with the French naturalist Georges-Louis Leclerc and the philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who was a huge fan of Madeleine's work. He once wrote, Nature gives plants their existence, but Mademoiselle Bassaport preserves them for us forever.
Madeline was also a contemporary of Carl Linnaeus, and on January 30th in 1749, Bernard Jussieu wrote a letter to Linnaeus teasing him that Madeline was, quote, very proud of the title you give her of your second wife. Well, despite her work alongside the top scientific minds of her time, her beautiful, botanically accurate art, and her groundbreaking appointment, Madeline, unlike her predecessor, Claude Aubrier, was never honored with the naming of any flower. But that doesn't mean she wasn't deserving of it. Today, scholars hold Madeline's work in high esteem as scientific art designed to show the structure and physiology of her plant subjects in addition to being beautiful. Now, to me, Madeline's art has a delicate, sensitive quality, and her expression of leaves in particular shows her depth of understanding regarding her plant subjects. And in 2021, the author and professor Nina Gelbart wrote a book called Minerva's French Sisters by Yale Press. And the book explores the biographies of six forgotten female scientists from 18th century France, which happens to be Nina's specialty. And it includes the story of Madeleine Francoise Bassaport. Well, that's it for today's show. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And just remember that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day.